Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to Inglebard Gaming. Today I've got a quick review of a device many of you have probably seen online somewhere in the last couple of weeks. The Ambernic RG35XXSP. You may think you've heard everything that there is to hear about the 35XXSP. If you think that... Well, you're wrong! I definitely have a few things to say that differ from most of the other reviews out there that I've seen. In the interest of full disclosure, I bought this device with my own money, Amberdick doesn't know about this review and isn't seeing it in advance, and that will become apparent pretty quickly. Let's get on with it. Alright, so first up, this is the device itself. The Amberdick RG35XXSP, a sleek name by the way, rolls right off the tongue. Let's agree that I'll shorten that to Amberdick SP for most of this video. The Ambernic SP mimics the look and feel of the Game Boy Advance SP from a couple of decades ago. Yes, GBA SP fans will instantly notice that the Ambernic version here is considerably chunkier than the system upon which it is based. And actually, I like that part better, since in my old age, I find it gets really uncomfortable to hold systems that are too thin for any length of time. From a visual standpoint, sure, Ambernic pretty much nailed it. The GBA SP only had two action buttons, two shoulder buttons, start, select, and a brightness button. Ambernic changed the brightness button to the menu key and added two more face and shoulder buttons to make it more appropriate for lots of other systems games like the SNES or PlayStation. We also get two micro SD card slots, one for the card with your operating system and the second slot is optional and you can insert a card to hold your game ROMs and images. It has a regular 1 8 inch headphone jack, a volume rocker on the left side, power and reset on the right, and a USB power port and a mini HDMI out port on the back. If you weren't aware, the original GBA SP didn't even have a normal headphone jack, so score one for Ambernick here. And finally for colors, you've got a few options, I'll put them all on screen here, this is what they have right now. I'm kind of disappointed that more classic Game Boy Advance SP colors weren't available, I would like to have either had the blue or the red ones, uh, but oh well, we got what we got. Now, the not so great parts. First up, look at my D-pad here. I received my Ambernic SP with an imperfection. It has a tiny chunk missing right below the down direction on the D-pad. This is clearly a manufacturing defect, as this thing was packed up very securely when it shipped. Next up, the buttons and D-pad themselves. Yeah, they're all very loud and clicky, but so were the original GBA SP buttons, so I'm okay with it in this case. They're a bit louder than the original GBA SP, and users have posted mod videos that already show you things you can do to mitigate that if it bothers you. I've also seen some reviews that assert the Ambernic SP's buttons aren't any louder than other indie systems. Put in person? They sure as f**k are louder. I'll also note that the single speaker embedded into the base of the unit is really surprisingly loud. It could stand to be clearer and have stronger bass, but it gets the job done well enough. I found I had to keep my volume really low to prevent it from utterly destroying what remains of my eardrums after a lifetime of abusing them. So far, the hinge seems alright. I mean, obviously I can't tell you how it'll last yet. I haven't seen any complaints about broken hinges yet on forums or Reddit or anywhere, but hey, you never know. There might be one up now. <laughs> now it has basically two positions where it snaps into place. The first position it feels pretty firm, the second position doesn't. It's just past 180 degrees for that second one, and I never use that on the original SP and I won't use it with this either. And speaking of the original GBA SP, the hinge on the Ambernic SP does not feel as solid as Nintendo's GBA SP, but it doesn't feel bad either. Now I've gotta say, there is kind of a major problem with the D-pad that comes pretty close to making it a deal breaker, honestly. It's pretty easy to press the entire D-pad down in all directions at once by accident during gameplay, especially when you're playing something like a shooter or shmup where you'll be moving and snaking around all over the screen. If you accidentally press it in, all movement gets cancelled and your character on screen just flat out stops. I found myself having to consciously avoid doing it, because it happened several times while I was testing on several different games. And I don't feel like this is something people should have to get used to. Obviously, it matters more for certain game genres than others. Finally, overall it does feel a little bit on the cheap side. You won't mistake this for a GBA SP quality-wise. I also found while playing it, the battery door is flimsy, and I can feel it getting pushed in or bending slightly while I grip the system during gameplay. I mean, it creaks a little bit. At this point, it's a pretty big concern for me. So physically, there's definitely some room for improvement here. Now don't get me wrong, it's not all bad, it's not a disaster or anything, but I have to say it feels less durable than the last Ambernic device I bought, which was the Ambernic RG Arc D. 
In my review of that one, I mentioned it felt like it was just a little bit, you know, on the cheap side. And I've got to say, the SP feels worse. But hey, it actually also is cheaper, so there's that. The SOC, or System on a Chip, in this Ambernic device is a familiar one that's appeared in a few of their other devices too. It uses an all-winner H700, it runs a customized version of Linux, has 1GB of RAM, and comes with a 64GB microSD card containing the operating system and some other stuff that we'll talk about in a few seconds. Now the screen is a 3.5-inch 640x480 IPS panel, which is fine and it seems to be pretty decent quality, about on par at least, with the one in the Ambernic RG Arc. Now my first surprise after powering the unit on is that it included an SD card that contains not only the operating system, but also a whole bunch of game ROMs for various systems. Naughty naughty, Ambernick, you know you're not allowed to sell those things. But anyway, heads up, if piracy of old games bothers you, I fully understand and you'll probably want to avoid a purchase for that reason alone. Now, I didn't know they did this, and I didn't expect it to come with any ROMs on it. Anyway, aside from that, the performance story for the SP is a familiar one, once all is said and done. You can expect basically anything 16-bit and below to work just fine. Some 32-bit era systems and beyond work with varying results. GBA and PS1 are fine from the games I tested, and you can even run some Dreamcast games at full speed on this thing. But frankly, for an analog stick, I'm not too interested in playing games from newer generation systems on the SP anyway, although there are some that I'm fine without one. Now, I will mention for this review, I am using the included stock operating system only. There are quite a few alternative operating systems available that you can install to replace the stock one, and I may cover them in the future. But for this review, I'm only covering the device as shipped by Ambernick. So anyway, right away, there are some issues you'll notice with how Ambernick chose to do things here. You have two options for launching games, the Game Room and RetroArch. They don't launch the same games with the same settings. You'll find different filters and bezels and sometimes different default emulators in the Game Room versus RetroArch. Using the Game Room launcher, the interface is limited and you can't adjust much of anything from the menu. One interesting thing I noted here is that emulators for systems that shouldn't be very taxing on something modern, like Capcom CPS1 emulation for instance, suffered from frame skipping on the SP. Arcade Strider, which you could run on a 200 MHz Pentium 1 PC 30 years ago, had frame skipping on the SP. I witnessed this in some other games too. Most games also launch with graphical filters on and you have to manually turn them off. If you're using this launcher and want to get rid of them, press the menu button, go into settings, then click fast for the filter. Now even with the filter off though, expect frame skipping for some reason. When launching games through RetroArch instead, you have a few more options. However, Ambernick for some reason has limited several of the options that you would normally see in RetroArch. They removed a whole bunch of settings that we should have access to, including easy quick menu access for things like bezels and filters. Instead, the system chooses these things for you by default. Now you can turn them off entirely by going into the application menu in the operating system itself, but I haven't found an easy menu-based way to just pick a bezel or choose a default shader. Now you can choose a general filter in RetroArch if you want, but they removed the option to choose them from the quick menu for each system individually, and I just don't get why they did that. And yeah, I did go to enable advanced options in RetroArch, and I did that, and those options are still missing after doing that. And one more note here, the default shader with the Game Boy Advance logo at the bottom of the screen that you've seen in most videos on this thing, well, it has an LCD dot filter applied, which I personally thought looked terrible. And the GBA logo actually cuts off a little bit of the bottom of the screen. So turning that thing off was a major priority for me, and I did it right away, which is why you're not seeing it at all in footage in this video. I'll also note playing this stuff directly through RetroArch, I didn't have the same performance problems that I did from the Game Room launcher. Strider worked fine with no frame skipping in MAME 2003, for example. And while the options in RetroArch are limited, more limited than they should be, you do still have more options here than you do in the Game Room Launcher, and you can even do things like load games directly from the RetroArch menu, which is my preferred way of doing things, actually. I'm really not one for fancy RetroArch interfaces. So after my initial shock that a bunch of games that should have been fine were actually using frame skipping, I was able to rectify that by launching via RetroArch instead and choosing the best emulator for the job manually. It's not a big deal for me since I've been using RetroArch for years now, but if you're new to it or thinking about buying this device for someone that isn't especially technically inclined, they may have some issues with it. Still, once I got everything going the way it should have been from the start, performance was fine and as expected for all major systems. There are some other settings and shortcuts you have access to. You can get to some items by hitting the menu key when not inside another app, but you'll see there aren't exactly a ton of user-changeable options in that screen. There's an apps, uh, app, 
in the main OS menu that gives you a bit more granular control over a few things, but it's not even always clear exactly what's going on when you change a setting. Ambernic certainly made some choices here. The battery life for the Ambernic XP is listed at approximately 8 hours, and I can confirm that's pretty much what my experience has been with it so far. I've spent time playing a mix of simple and more advanced systems on it. I'd estimate that I've gotten between 7 and 8 hours on a charge so far, and it's taken between like 2.5 to 3 hours to charge it to full. And while I won't take the battery compartment lid off in this video, yes, the battery is right above the SoC. In my testing so far, the system did not get uncomfortably warm no matter what I was playing. I've seen others say it has for them, and I believe them. I just haven't experienced that myself yet. The only time it felt too warm to comfortably hold for me was while it was charging. Based on what I'd seen in prior reviews, I was all ready to get a heatsink and install it on this thing, but I've decided against it for now since it's been fine so far. Uh, if I do notice it getting hot later, I may go ahead and do that, but for now I just don't feel the need. Oh, and the battery drain in standby mode? Yeah, it's unacceptably high. I found myself turning the system off instead of putting it in standby. I'd say the only real use for standby is if you plan to use the device within 30 minutes or so after putting it into that state. Otherwise, I'd just recommend turning it off. The average claim online right now is that the SP loses about 3-5% to in standby mode per hour. And yeah, that's been my experience just before recording this video. I put it into standby mode for three hours. When I popped it open, I saw that I lost 14% of my charge. It may sound like I've been a little tough on the SP so far, and yeah, I guess I have been, especially compared to some of the glowing reviews I've seen out there, but there's one area where the SP absolutely nails it, and that's the nostalgia factor. If you had a Game Boy Advance SP when you were a kid or when you were just younger, if you get one of these in your hands again, you might just find yourself mentally transported back to that simpler era with a big smile on your face. And that counts for a lot. It's really the entire selling point for this thing and the whole reason it exists. We're at a place right now with indie portable systems where the manufacturers you know, only make money selling the hardware. So they need you to keep buying new hardware, and one way to do that is to offer their own takes on iconic designs, and that's where stuff like the Ambernic 35XX SP and their prior RG Arc really shine. It's easy to forgive a lot of shortcomings once those memories come flooding back in. Now I've had fun with the Ambernic SP, and can definitely see myself using it when I want to play Game Boy, Game Boy Color, or Game Boy Advance games. And it's also small when closed, so despite its thickness, I haven't had problems sticking it in a pants pocket. I can also see myself carrying it when I need to go out and about, and I don't want to lug around something bigger like the RG Arc or the Odin 2 with me. In conclusion, I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up here and give you my review score for the Amberdick 35XX SP. On the plus side, the Amberdick SP looks great even if it's not exactly the same as the original GBA SP design. The relatively low-res screen looks pretty good, and it can run a bunch of games from a lot of systems, but it's going to really excite those who primarily plan to play Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance games on it. If you want to feel like you're playing a real GBA SP, the Ambernic 35XX SP will definitely scratch that itch. Plus, when folded up, you have a small little brick that's pretty easy to transport. Battery life in general is decent, and hey, this thing is relatively cheap, about 70-ish dollars shipped in the US. On the downside, the build quality is on the lower end of the spectrum, and a little worse than I expected. In addition to that, I showed you the defect on mine under the D-pad. The lack of options, including the ones in RetroArch that were specifically removed, is pretty frustrating, honestly. I get they were probably trying to make the device friendlier for those aren't who are especially tech-savvy, but still, more options would have been better. Also, the poor performance and frame skipping in some of the default emulators from the Game Room Launcher was another unpleasant surprise. And hey, Ambernick, if you're watching this, stop shipping pirated ROMs with your systems. The big companies aren't going to stand for that forever, you know. Anyway, the biggest issues here are definitely the D-pad, standby power depletion, and that flimsy battery cover which sometimes creaks when I use the thing. So in the end, there's quite a mix of good and not so good here, but I'd still say for the price you get a mostly positive experience right out of the box. You'll have to adjust to the D-pad, especially if you're a shooter or a shmup fan, uh, and it ain't great for fighting games either, but hey, neither was the D-pad on the real GBA SP. I'm giving the Ambernic 35XX SP a final review score of 7 out of 10. I struggled in deciding between a 6 and 7 for this one, folks, but considering the whole package and who this is really aimed at, the price, the nostalgia factor, and general functionality, it overcomes some of its limitations a bit. Now, I didn't set out to be contrarian or anything here. I like the Ambernic SP, but I do feel like its current reputation isn't really fully deserved. It's good, but it's not great. 
and while I will continue to use it, it definitely won't get as much playtime as either my Ark or my Odin 2. So tell me, what do you think? Do you have an Ambernick SP? Do you love it? Do you hate it? Did you decide one way or another on getting the thing after watching this review? Tell me all about it in the comments. And that'll do it for this video, my retro gaming friends. If you enjoyed it, please like it and share it online somewhere. If you haven't yet, subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you'll never miss one of my videos. If you want to support the work that I do here and make it so I can keep buying things like this, you can do that on Patreon, Ko-fi, or right here on YouTube through channel memberships. With that, I'll say thanks for watching, and see me later.